get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise And I want to also give a big shout out to, to Ian Garlic, host of the Garlic Marketing Show For telling me about Christopher's book um, it's amazing. You got to check it out. It's called Play Bigger, and I'll introduce it in a second. But um, so, if you didn't know already, you are uh, listening to InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And our sponsor is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, anyone working with one-on-one clients. Stop just trading time for dollars and shift from a one-to-one client work to one-to-many. So you can go there. There's a, uh, a dream product ladder template that you can use to realize it's plan- basically planning your business on one sheet of paper that shows gaps of untapped revenue. Disney uses it, Apple, Sporting Industry, they all use versions of the product ladder. So I have, I'm excited to, to introduce today's guest, Christopher Lockhead, who started his first company at 18. He retired 30 years later. Well, retired is a term he's still working, but doing what he loves to do when he wants and who he wants to do it with. He's a three-time public company CMO, best-selling author, host of Legends and Losers, which uh, he's already mentioned. You should check it out. He's co-founder of Play Bigger Advisors. He served as chief marketing officer of Mercury Interactive, a $1 billion software company that was acquired by Hewlett Packard in 2006 for $4.5 billion. And like I mentioned, he's the co-author with Al Ramadan, Dave Peterson, and Kevin Maney of Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Thank you so much, Chris, for doing this. Thanks, Jeremy. That The introduction is going to make my mom real happy. Thank we'll you. Send it That's to very, her. very yeah. kind of you. I asked what's top of mind. You said inauthent- inauthenticity and Fortune Magazine type of stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know about you, Jeremy. I just I'm I'm at a point in my life where I just can't take you know, we look, we had Eric Weinmeyer on Legends and Losers. He's the first blind guy to summit Everest. He's the first mm. blind guy to That's um, awesome. solo kayak the Grand Canyon. He's one of the most extraordinary extreme adventure athletes in the world and he's an amazing guy. Yeah. And he said a lot of amazing amazing stuff on on Legends and Losers, but the, th- the one of the things he said that is just ricocheted around my brain ever since is the world doesn't need more bullshit. <laughs> and so whether it's, you know, what, what, Kardashian, what did he mean by that? What did he mean by that? Do you think I was, I was asking him, he's a pretty famous guy. And I think I just have a sense and based on nothing. And this is what I asked him. I, I just had a sense that he's going to be like crazy famous. Like I, I have a hard time believing that Brad Pitt doesn't play him in a movie. Mm. I mean, when you're the first guy to summit all seven summits and you're blind and you write a book that's this big called No Barriers about solo kayaking the Grand Canyon, mm. fuck, fucking blind. And, and, and by the way, what he what he what he's really committed to now is his is his nonprofit, No mm. Barriers. And he takes people with all sorts of disabilities. He takes vets with PTSD um, and puts them in these kind of a- a- adventure sports environments to show them how they can have a phys- how they can have a breakthrough physically, hmm. because I, he said the number on on the episode, but there, like a huge percentage of blind people are unemployed, hmm. you know, and so so people who, with disability of one sort or another, their world can get smaller, and he wants their world to be bigger. Anyway, long story longer, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm asking him. I said, you know, it, you're going to be famous, and there's or you're going to be even more famous. I can just tell, and and there's a certain amount of your job that has to be self promotional. And so I was asking him how he thought about that. Um, and that's when he said, look, yes, do I need to be somewhat famous to get done what we need to get done? OK. And, and he got animated and he said, but the world doesn't need more bullshit. Mm-hmm. And so what I believe is 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 there's there's levels of bullshit. Right. And so there's Kardashian selfie books. <laughs> And, and absolutely asinine tweets and all this, you know, social media, look at me, look at me for the sake of look at me bullshit. Right. So there's there's that. But then worse than that is what we what we have to consume in the business world. 
So, you know, public company chief executives get on earnings calls and, and spew bullshit. And they say shit like, oh, uh, we had a slight uh, a slight negative earnings growth this quarter. What? Slight negative what, negative earnings growth. What the fuck is that? Oh, earnings were down. That's what you're trying to say. Why don't you say earnings are down? Right. And we just there's this bullshit speak. Right. There's this politically correct mamby pamby indirect speak right. right we just had kim scott on who's like the guru of of uh, extreme candor right and she talks about why it's powerful to be candid we're not candid with each other anymore we speak in these bullshitty terms and then you know to the point we were just on if you look at most business media you know and 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 i i don't mean to pick on them but let's pick on them fortune magazine by way of example uh it's bullshit. Most of it's bullshit. And the reason I say it's bullshit is you have a very sophisticated, quote unquote, journalist who's got a pre-configured narrative that she or he is trying to forward with a, quote unquote, interview. Right. They have their interview questions. They're trying to get the thing out of the, the, the interviewee predicated on a pre-built narrative. Right. right. Yeah. It's like a scientist not having a hypothesis and trying to prove it out as opposed to correct yeah and then and then the, the executive or entrepreneur or whoever the fuck they're interviewing that's a person who's been trained and, and is very media savvy they've got their three bullet points they've given it to to public uh, to uh, interview school right they know how to quote unquote bridge back so you know y you can ask me any question you want and i'm going to feed you one of my three fucking talking points right <laughs> And so what we end up with, you and I, as consumers of this stuff, is just bullshit. Somebody feeding us what they want to feed us. Somebody giving us a prefab na narrative. And the two ships may or may not meet in the night. And it's just actually not that interesting or helpful. Right. And if it's a public company, there's the, it, it, it blows me away that since the introduction of Sarbanes-Oxley, all we've had is like an increase in the level of... Uh, uh, muddiness as opposed to an increase in transparency because fucking CEOs of public companies today are like locked down like never before. We have an episode of Legends and Losers with Doug Merritt, the CEO of $12 billion Splunk. And I, I think that episode is going to change the way um, chief executives think about communicating because mm. Doug communicates like a human being. And so I, I guess my point is uh, I think – we're entering a new era of authenticity. You and I can smell bullshit a mile away. And uh, I think a lot of people have had it. And I also think I'm incredibly passionate about podcasting because this is really the only medium where you can have real, raw, authentic conversations that matter for any length of time that matters. You know, right. we had sitting Superior Court Judge Filer for uh, Los Angeles County in Compton, California on Legends and Losers. It's an hour and a half long episode with a sitting superior court judge. Now, if Judge Filer was on 60 Minutes, and if 60 Minutes is listening, Judge Filer should be on 60 Minutes because he's one of the most inspiring Americans and human beings you'll ever meet. And, but if he was on 60 Minutes, we would get six to eight minutes with him at most. Right. And it would be sound bites fed to us, and that would be the end of it. Yeah. And so my, my, my point in all that, Jeremy, is, you know, I think for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. We, we know that. And so for every Kardashian selfie, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. And, right. And I, so I think we're in a, in a time and a place in our world where um, people are just starving for things that are real. Yeah. I mean, the epitome, you know, Chris, of the, the long form is I know you're into um kind of MMA type of stuff and uh, Joe Rogan, right? I mean, he's the epitome of just long form. His his conversation could go for three hours, right? Yeah, that's right. And I, you know, I love Rogan and I love him for lots of reasons. But I, I, I what I love about his podcast is, you know, he is, uh, and we share the same format. So I'm biased to this format, right? right, the, right. Di the dialogue format as right. opposed to the interview format. But the reason I'm biased towards it is, um, if the individuals having the dialogue are compelling, then I want to hear the dialogue. Right. 
I, I don't. You, want you don't want the two minute snippet. You want the I whole thing. Yeah. I, I'm the same way. I like exactly. Don't don't tell me what the three big fucking learnings are. Don't tell me that the this is the value bomb or fuck. I don't know. Like whatever. <laughs> like I, uh, enough with that. You know. Right. Um. I, I mean, look, it has its place, but yeah. The thing that I love about podcasting, Jeremy, and I really do think we're in the first inning, is there's no other medium where you can have an authentic dialogue with a guy like Judge Filer and really get into it and go for everything from how his father, Maxie Filer, uh, was the founder of the NAACP in Compton and what it was like being mm. five years old growing up with, with, with those meetings taking place in your house to what it's like to be the judge at a murder trial, to his love of karaoke and what it took for him, him to overcome his alcoholism. Like mm. that, that's a giant conversation to have, right? right? Particularly with a superior court judge. And, and so my point is the, the reason podcasting I think is so powerful is you and I get to have uh, as podcasters and we get to experience as podcast consumers, um, you know, real authentic dialogues with people uh, on topics that we care about that matter and make a difference in a way that would not be possible on the radio, would not be possible um, on TV or really mm -hmm. in any other format. And that, that's and so all that is to say, I think we're entering a new era of authenticity with all this noise that we have in our world today. I think people are craving it. And I think um, in a lot of ways, podcasts are the primary medium for delivering mm -hmm. um you know, real authentic content. Yeah. And Chris, I want to give, uh, I'll give proper context. I mean, because you've been a, inside of this as a three-time public company CMO. So I'll give proper context to people on your background and everything. But I, I want to dig into that for a second is you've also seen the beginnings of innovation and obviously play bigger. Your book, which we'll talk about, talks about that. And you, what's interesting is you say the podcasting, it's the first inning. So I'm wondering what you, where do you think it's going? And because some people would say, yes, this is the beginning. And some people say it's saturated and everyone's getting into it. So I'm curious of what you mean by first inning and where do you think it's going? Yeah. So I think it's the first inning for a lot of reasons um, in, in no particular order. Number one, most people in America have not consumed a podcast this month. So there's a tremendous amount of upside left in terms of category potential um, with audience development. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so that's number one. So I think that's exciting and that's in America and you know, rest of world is, 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 is behind that best we can tell. So, and, uh, by the way, I, I say rest of world with a smile on my face. I'll never forget, uh, when I first got to Silicon Valley and, um, you know, a, a lot of companies out here will have a, a VP of, uh, us or North American sales, and then they'll have a VP of international, right? Like it's all one thing, but I'll never forget the first time. And so the, even the word like international, like there's America and then there's international. I find kind of funny because I grew up in international. Um, and and but but even funnier than international is uh, U.S. and rest of world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always thought rest of world was such a funny expression but i digress so rest of world is is probably behind the u.s in terms of podcast consumption so i think there's a lot of upside point a yeah um uh, point b if you look at the format of podcasts uh you have essentially radio shows on the internet sure and with all due respect to radio shows on the internet and there's some radio shows on the internet i happen to love Radio shows on the internet are not fucking podcasts because radio is predicated on a set of conditions that don't exist in the podcast world. For example, high cost of creation of content and high cost of distribution. So, you know, when you have to pay for studio time and you have to pay massive amounts for distribution and so forth and so on, then, you know, you're not, if you're, uh, I'll just pick an example of a famous radio personality if you're terry gross in the united states um you're gonna have a half hour show you're gonna have a 45 minute show and you're right. gonna have those breaks in there you're because, limited yeah well the, the npr stations are not gonna buy uh, a three hour show from terry gross right right and so my point is um 
people have taken the old paradigm from the old medium and are just redoing it in the new medium. And so I think that most podcasters don't take advantage of the fact that content creation and distribution for all practical purposes is free or pretty close to free. And, um, and so that I think that means something in terms of what you can do. And so on the entertainment side, we're starting to see these podcasts that show up that are very professionally produced, that are, that are serial in nature. And, um, and they're these compelling, you know, stories, these narratives that go over time, the, 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 these, um, uh, you know, kind of entertainment, um, and they're sort of like these very long, uh, books on tape. Right. And that, that, that's cool. Um, for sure that's cool. And then, um, you know, on the, on the non-entertainment side, if you will, on, 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 on uh, the non-fiction side, I think you're starting to see an increase in the amount of, uh, this new category of podcast that you could think of as a, uh, a real dialogue podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, where people have an authentic conversation and it doesn't get, you know, broken down into the three main points and the sound bites and, and, and a bunch of spoon fed, you know, pablomatic bullshit that we've all heard before. And so that 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 tells me we're also, uh, Jeremy, in the beginning, because podcasters are, are exper- finally experimenting with formats, realizing they don't have radio or television. They're not restricted. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. You know, and you, you can podcast from anywhere. You can podcast from your hotel room or your iPhone or, you know. Uh, and so it just opens up a lot, a lot of creativity that I think um, we're in the very beginning of. So I, I find that, you know, incredibly exciting. Yeah. I want to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. I was asking, what are you doing after this? And you said, you're going to go help Papa, right? Yeah. And how Papa embodies many things. So I just kind of wanted you to start there for a second. Yeah, so Papa. Uh, father-in-law Phil and um, and he's uh, uh, 86 years old and he runs what we believe is the last uh, commercial orchard in San Jose California Hmm. Uh, so Silicon Valley used to not be Silicon Valley Silicon Valley used to be the Valley of Orchards and um, a lot of peaches a lot of stone fruit typically and and, uh, Papa has about two and a half acres with over 600 fruit trees and um you know italian family and so as you as you might expect big family as you might expect yeah. and uh three girls uh of which my my wife carrie is one and um you know during the summer uh well all year round really but especially during the summer when there's a lot of picking of fruit to be done um you know the whole family is 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 is, is in the boat rowing mm-hmm. And um, and so this morning, once uh, once you and I are done, Jeremy, I'm going to run over to San Jose and um, uh, help Papa get the fruit stand ready. And and then the other cool thing is, um, yeah, so he just so, just so you kind of get a picture in your head. So imagine a home uh, and then imagine two and a half acres with fruit trees, mostly peaches, but a whole mix of things. Um, and then imagine a little fruit stand on the side of the driveway where things are sold on the honor system. And then imagine that in what today is a suburban neighborhood. Of course, it wasn't a suburban neighborhood when it got started. Uh, his father. I'm my trying wife, to picture this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, you know, there's houses and condos and all this shit around it. And then there's this little uh, orchard, this little magic garden, this little mm-hmm. tiny farm. Right. And then everything's sold on the honor system. Uh, a fruit stand on the side of the house. And of, of, of course, this thing's a labor of love. Sure, it makes some money, but it's 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 not Facebook. Um, and, um, and 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 you have this extraordinary human being in my father-in-law who spends, you know, four to six hours a day, uh, five to seven days a week in the orchard. And he's eighty-six yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's great. Yeah. So you said he embodies a lot of things. Um, what were you what were you going to talk about for that yeah i think i think my uh, uh my father-in-law phil aka papa um i think he's emblematic jeremy of everything a man uh a man is a man should be you know he um he's a simple man and i say that with admiration and love you know my big aspiration in life is to be simple to have a simple life and so for phil he loves his wife he loves his family uh he loves his church he loves his, his fruit trees in his community and he loves his country. End of discussion <laughs> like that. And now, you know, Phil, right? Uh, he served our country proudly 
as a Marine in, uh, in the Korean conflict, um, you know, an enlisted Marine. And um, you can't love your family more than Phil does. You can't be a better man than Phil is. He's, his word is his bond. Um, and he's an incredibly honorable. Um, and uh, he, he loves his girls. He loves his family. No one told Phil that they were girls. So from the time they were very little, they were working, you know, very hard in the, in the culture. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he loves his wife. He has an incredible marriage to an extraordinary, an extraordinary woman named Jean. And, and so I'll, t I'll tell you what I said to him last Father's Day. I said to him, Papa, I realize I've never told you what I tell other people about you. Right. That's often and the so case, right? Yeah, and so it occurred to me, he's 80 fucking six, why not tell him now? Right. And so I said, can I tell you what I tell other people? And he said, sure. And I said, well, that you are an icon of what a man should be. Hmm. You're an example for all of us every day, and I'm proud to be in, in a family where you're the patriarch. Hmm. What did he say? He's a quiet guy. He's an introvert. So he said, thank you. He said, thank you. Go out, pick more peaches for me. No. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. And I, I also, I got to tell you, he's excited uh, uh, to see me this morning because, so we live right on the coast. He lives a little bit inland from us. And so as you were talking before you hit record, there's some, there are microclimates in Northern California. So all that is to say it's cooler here on the coast than it is inland in San Jose where he is. And so our growing season and what we can grow is a little bit different. So all that said, uh, Carrie and I have uh, a very prolific uh, fig tree, hmm. and our figs uh, sprout, you know, I don't know, four four weeks or so later than his. So so all the figs on that side of the the mountain range are gone, and so figs are selling for a dollar seventy five a fig right now for fresh. That's uh, wild. Farm, farm figs, and so I, wow. I yesterday I picked. Just you know, I, I picked everything that was ripe on our on our fig tree, and I have a big tray of uh, very expensive figs that I'm going to bring to Papa today because we can extend his season. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the book, play bigger. Are you the pirate? How, what's the where's the subhead come from? How pirates, dreamers, innovators create and dominate markets. Yeah, I think of the group of us, I'm probably the pirate. I think we say that in the book, uh, although I think that was Kevin's observation. So, um, I think they call you Bruce Willis in the book at some point, right? The Bruce Willis of marketing, or there's something, a reference in there. Uh, you're going to, uh, yes, I guess. You'll have to excuse me. You know, we handed in the manuscript uh, a, a while ago, of course, because the book's been out for a year. Yeah. And But more importantly, um, the book's my life, Jeremy. So, like, I, you know, I just, uh, I don't know what's in the book and what's in my life. <laughs> so, I'll just say yes. If it, if you remember it, it must be in the book. So, what is this? Where'd you come up with the subhead line? Um, the pirates, dreamers, innovators. Is that a combination of the three of you, or is it just talking about businesses in general? A little bit of both, I think. Yeah. I think more businesses in general, yeah. because you have to have uh, some of the ethos of those three things to mm. be a legendary um, uh, entrepreneur and innovator. And you have to have elements of those three things if you want to design and dominate a category. You know, the, the, the pirate part being the kind of, you know, storm the castle, slay the dragon, save the princess, kill the evil ruler and take over the kingdom. You know, that sort of that kind of a mentality the winner take all kind of swashbuckler and then look you, you truly have to be innovative innovative is, innovative is a word that's lost most of its meaning but um you can't do something legendary unless you do something legendary and you <laughs> and so you have to do something that is a meaningful breakthrough is a meaningful step forward it is it is something that's truly different just the legends don't you know come out with the 2.0 version of shit you know what I mean? They don't do sustaining innovation, <laughs> right? right. Um, and so, and so, you have to be truly innovative. And then, you know, it's interesting. We just had um, uh, Professor Tina Selig from Stanford uh, on Legends and Losers. She's such an incredible uh, human being. She's a, an expert on creativity, and her new book's called Creativity Rules. And hmm. 
she really believes and she's got the proof to back it up that uh, creativity can be taught. And when I asked her, Jeremy, I said, well, what do you mean creativity can be taught? She hit me in the head with something I didn't realize. You don't have to teach a kid creativity. Right. You hang out with a three-year-old or a two-year-old or a whatever-year-old, and, you know, they're, they're being creative. They're playing. They're playing is make-believe, right? They're drawing. They're, you know, doing what they're doing in the sand. They're, they're you know, playing with their poop. They're, they're doing creative stuff all the time, right? That's just... And so one of the things that uh, Professor Selig said was, you know, this is our natural state. Yeah. This is how we show up. And then and these are her words, not mine. I'm paraphrasing. But, you know, she says the education system beats the creativity out of us. Right. And so to get back to your question, all of us as kids are dreamers. Right. We're creative. There's no little kid that like is walking around going, when I grow up, I want to be, you know, a, a, a cube dwelling Gilbert <laughs> fuck. Right. There's nobody that says that. Right. <laughs> Right? We want to be Batman. We want to be Wonder Woman. We want to be whatever we want to be. We want to be something big. We want to be something important. We want to be something powerful. We want to be something that makes a difference. You know, yeah. nobody says I want to grow up and 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 be a loser, um, and and yet somehow, kind of life can get us. You know, and so I guess to get back to your question, I think you have to be uh, equal equal part uh, pirate dreamer and innovator mm -hmm. if you're going to make something legendary happen. And I will forever, Jeremy, be fascinated by a conversation about the moments of truth in people's life and the decisions they make in those moments, because those are the moments that that shape us, right? And we can our, our failures, for example, yeah. uh, can make us or break us, right? And, and so, who we are in those moments and how we play going forward uh, make a really big difference. And I think the thing that binds uh, category designers together and binds people with this pirate dreamer innovator spirit together is a general uh, disregard for status quo and a and a perspective. Personally, I, this is certainly where I come from, and I think it's where a lot of us who are trying to make shit happen come from, which is a, a questioning uh, curiosity kind of a place and a particularly with things that don't seem right to us, whether they're on, you know, business side, think products and services we want to bring to market or whether the things in our world that socially we think are wrong or could be better. We come at it with a point of view in innovators, category designers come at it with a point of view that says, to quote the big Lebowski, this aggression will not stand, man. Right. We want to we look at the way it is for whatever reason. It's not OK with us the way it is. And we think it should be another way, a different way. And we go to work on making it a different way because that's what people who make a difference in the world do. And, and that to me will always be a fascinating dialogue. And, and Play Bigger is a dialogue about how to make a really big difference by finding your place in the world with your company. Yeah. And you talk about moments that shape us. And I read that um, you were thrown out of school at 18. Yeah. Yeah. It turns out, Jeremy, that if you get shitty enough grades for long enough, they don't let you back in the building. I, I've never heard that. Yeah. That's don't let that get out. Most pe Some people will start doing that. You know, and it's funny. I, I, it, it wasn't until I was in my late 20s where I realized that people, your average person, has a huge uh, fear of getting fired. Uh, that was like news to me at 28 or something, right? Like, well, what? And, and I've always wondered why I could give a shit about getting fired, and I've been fired a lot. Um, and I think it might be because of that school experience. You know, what like, what happened after that? When that happened, what did you do? You know, it was a tough time, of course. Um, and so I had a choice, like a lot of us. You know, sometimes life gets uh, sort of fired at us uh, at close range. And I had a choice, and my choice was shave guys' balls for a living. Or start a company. I didn't know that first one was a choice. <laughs> yeah, well, it is a choice. There's a job called Shave Guys Balls. It, it, it's, they don't they don't market it as such, but it, the title of the job is orderly. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom, Jeremy, uh, worked for many years uh, in a hospital, and uh, she got me a job as an orderly as I was scraping my way through 
um, high school. And, um, and so that's what I did on the weekends part time. And so when I got thrown out of school, you know, I had moved out of the house. I moved out when I was 17. Um, uh, I was essentially staring at a career of manual labor. Right. Start a company. My friend Jack wanted to start a company. It was the birth of the PC. And he thought there was something that we could get done. And so um, with really no other option other than manual labor, uh, you know, entrepreneurship was my was was my uh, ticket out. You know, in Silicon Valley, we hear a lot about what you could think of as big E entrepreneurs. You know, I write an algorithm at Stanford. I'm 24 years old. And, uh, you know, uh, I raised two hundred million dollars from Sequoia. And I and I take over the world and go public and I'm a billionaire and I buy a Hawaiian island and, a, and, a, and you know, 15 blocks of Palo Alto. Right. So that's that's the story we hear a lot about. Um, and I love those biggie entrepreneurs. I spent the vast majority of my professional life um, working with them and still do. And most entrepreneurs are what you could think of as small entrepreneurs. You know, we're not that. And in my case. Uh, no education, no experience, no relationships, no knowledge of anything really, um, and started a company. And so it's easy, I think, to talk about entrepreneurship in the abstract, right? And, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur today is cool. I didn't know the, I didn't know the word entrepreneur when I, when I started, right? I, I, there was nothing cool about it. It was called fucking desperate. Right. Um, and so, but, but that said, um, Entrepreneurship is a way out for some of us, a, a way out of a life of struggle, a life of poverty. And I think when an entrepreneur rises up, not always, but often she takes a community with her. She takes a category with her. And so, um, you know, a big thing that I'm focused on today is entrepreneurship. I think category design makes a material difference. And we're at a point in time, Jeremy, where... Um, more companies die in America every week than are founded. Sure. And so we're at the lowest level of recorded entrepreneurship in American history. I think it's a terrible thing for our country. I think it's a terrible thing for our world um, because entrepreneurs build our country and world. And so we need to stoke and, 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 and spur more uh, entrepreneurs. And we need, I think we need to do everything we can to help entrepreneurs uh, be successful. And, you know, that's why I think category design matters so much. And I've really dedicated the back half of my life to trying to make a difference for um, entrepreneurs and, and people who want to be entrepreneurs. What did you start at the time? Uh, computer trading and consulting business. Hmm. What did Silicon Valley look like at the time? So I got to Silicon Valley 21 years ago, and um, it looked a lot different than it looks today. You know, there were... Um, there were a lot of, uh, there was a diversity of companies that I don't think we see today. Hmm. Yeah. And there was more hardware, and I think there was more infrastructure uh, than we see today. Um, and uh, the other thing, when I got to Silicon Valley uh, in the mid-90s, uh, it was just before the dot-com boom. And so... The people who were here were, you know, in the parlance of our times, Jeremy, a lot more legit. You know, they were legit scientists and computer uh, experts trying to do heavy science stuff. Um, some real, real D and R&D going on. You know, a huge, uh, the shadow of Hewlett Packard being the company that for all practical purposes created Silicon Valley. At the time, Intel was, you could argue, in its heyday. And so there was this huge Intel halo. Cisco was on fire. And so you had these big, very technical, enterprisey kind of companies that were very sort of science and, and R&D oriented. And today what we have, of course, we still have a lot of science and R&D. I'm not saying that went away. But, you know, the companies that cast the bigger shadows they don't want to call themselves this, but the truth is Facebook's a media company, right? Twitter's a media company. Of course, Netflix is a media company. And so there's a there's a shift from, if you will, you know, hardcore technology to more media oriented um, in the last 20 years. Hmm. I, I don't think there's any debate about that. 
And I also think you get a little bit more, and I know this makes me sound like a grumpy old man, but that's okay. You get to be a grumpy old man one day. I've wanted to be one since I was a kid. Uh, I, I think there's a there are more financial ambulance chasers out here, you know? There are more get-rich-quick asshole mm. artists out here. I was joking yesterday with my accountant, Greg, that uh, from a traffic perspective, Silicon Valley needs a good recession. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we need to clean out some of the quick get rich quick douchebags and 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 have a little bit more seriousness <laughs> but i also i don't want to sound like a grumpy old man in that i think a lot of these things are very very exciting and when we talk about why if you if you like yeah go ahead i think today is the greatest time in history to be uh, starting a company building a company running a company i think it's it's the greatest time and the most exciting time and i'm i'm way more excited about the future in business and the future in technology than i am about the past although i am interested in the past I'm curious, um, you know, from what I researched, Mercury Interactive and your role, you know, had a huge impact. And I'm curious what worked at the time with what you're doing and what um, did you run up against that didn't work? Yeah, great question. So um, Mercury was the um, most extraordinary company I've ever been associated with when talk about the different elements of why. Um, but the bottom line is the company was a, a gigantic category king. And um, the cool the cool thing about what happened was um, Mercury became the category king in a very tight niche that you could call software testing or QA testing for software, something along those quality management, uh, um, you know, at its lowest level, the most sort of uh, descriptive pejorative you could call it would be like a bug tracking software, right? Uh, but dominated that space and that space became a very important space. But like all category kings, if you're lucky enough to be a category king, which is an extraordinary achievement, even in a very tight, uh, if you will, niche down category, and it was a very niche technical space for sure. Yeah, uh, You get to this place where and this is exactly where Mercury was in the early part of the century, um, where your category king position becomes your biggest inhibit inhibitor to growth. Hmm. What do you mean? Well, when you're the category king of a category... You get pigeonholed? Exactly. And, and two things happen. One, you've taken two-thirds of the economics, but the category is growing however it's growing. So, you know, you could have 76% of the economics in the category, but if the category is growing at 15% a year then you know, you're gonna grow at 15% a year. Maybe you can grow at 18% a year. You grow faster than the category because you're the king. But essentially you're tied to that category and as the king soaking up the vast of the majority of the economics, you, you have a hard time breaking out of the growth rate of the category. Yeah. Um, so so after, you know, I don't know exactly how old Mercury was at the time, but approximately 15 years, you know, the company's a category king, but its growth is, is inhibited by the growth of the space and the growth of the space kind of is what it is at the time. Um, that's kind of point A. And point B, some very big competitors are trying to encroach on the category, right? So as you know, um, categories morph, categories change, and, and some niche categories become a, if you will, a feature in a bigger category. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think companies like Hewlett Packard, companies like BMC and IBM were, were also trying to encroach on Mercury, trying to make them a feature of a bigger uh, of a bigger suite of products. Mm -hmm. So I think you had those two dynamics going on and, and, and several others, but those were probably the big ones. And so we had to, what in classic terms you could think of as reposition the company. Mm -hmm. uh, but in point of fact, what we were really doing is designing a whole new category. Right. And we were successful in doing that. And as a result, um, uh, more than doubled the market cap of the company and, and sold the company for a meaningful premium to Hewlett Packard. Um, and, and away we went, you know, for a four and a half billion dollar outcome. Um, and so it's an extraordinary thing to be part of a category king. You know, I joined an existing category king. That's cool. I think everybody should experience that in their career. If you haven't worked at a category king, it's an eye opening experience. Um, and then even more importantly, to be able to take that position and uh, catapult ourselves into a category that was easily three times bigger mm. and to become the category king. In With that the category. redesign, you mean? With the, 
design. Yeah. So what was the what was cons- like the term? You know, and, and anyone again, if you get play bigger, they go really in depth in the category Kim's across different industries. Um, what was considered the term? for what they were in mercury interactive was a the category king term and then what did you actually redesign it to be yeah great question so the term most people used was software quality or qa Mm -hmm. testing some Mm -hmm. something you know words to that effect quality qa things along those lines um and then we changed it to a very different thing we called business technology optimization or bto for short short and uh it was a big stretch to go from this little niche called software testing and software quality to this big thing that nobody knew what it was, BTO, business technology optimization. And and the point of view around BTO was, was encapsulated in a simple phrase, which was run it like a business. Mm -hmm. And and, and the the point being that it had uh, optimized and automated and re-engineered every other part of the enterprise except itself. And so BTO is to uh, IT what, for example, uh, CRM is to sales and marketing or ERP is to finance and manufacturing. Right. That was sort of the analogy, the conversation we were trying to have. And our mantra, our point of view was run IT like a business. And I, we could, I can unpack the point of view if you want. Yeah. But- I'm just wondering, how did you know to even do that at the time? I'm sure like if you take CMOs across the country, they may not be like, well, I think we should redesign the category. Right. Yeah. So I think for a couple of reasons. So I've, this is what I've done for 30 years. I've never done the let's compete for market share in the existing category. Right. Um, and so maybe let's take a step back, Jeremy. Most people make a unconscious, unquestioned, unexamined, untalked about, unconsidered decision. It's so fucking unconsidered. It's as unconsidered in business as you and I did not consider when we woke up this morning that there'd be fucking gravity and oxygen. That was not something we thought about. We got out of bed and there was gravity and oxygen and we just got going. And so unquestioned like gravity and, and, and oxygen are unquestioned is the following. When we launch our new company, product, brand, service, carbodingulator, we are going to launch the carbodingulator into an existing market with existing customers. And we believe in our bones that our product, company, service, brand, carbodingulator is, and I use this word on purpose, better than everything that came before. And therefore, from a marketing perspective, what we need to do is market our better features. And when the world sees our better features, we are going to have a disproportionate amount of market share. That's the game. That's what we get taught in business school. And it's so much the fucking game, no one even talks about it. And then when you really look at it, Jeremy, like a lot of things, and you do the work, and we did $750,000 worth of primary research for this book, and I spent 30 years working on this topic. Right. Everything I just said, that's not what Steve Jobs did. That's not what Sarah Blakely did. That's not what Muhammad Ali did. That's not what Bob Marley did. And it sure as hell ain't what Mark Zuckerberg did. They, so what I'm saying to you is the big aha, competition is for losers. What all those people who I just mentioned did was they made a conscious choice. They said, I want to be compared to nothing i want everything that comes after to be compared to me i'm taking new ground i'm setting new rules i am the new standard in this space by which all others get measured so for example bob marley is the category designer of a new genre of music called reggae music right now who would you rather be bob marley or the 87th reggae band and compete with Bob for share, right? Yeah. And so whether whether it's music or whether it's business, the aha is twofold. Number one, the companies that make a difference don't compete for share 
they create whole new categories and they teach the world specifically how to think about a problem and therefore a solution in a completely different way. And when they do that, ba bam, you get Steve Jobs, you get Sarah Blakely at Spanx, you get Henry Ford. Um, the other sort of big aha is competing for market share is absolute insanity because in space after space after space, one company takes the vast majority of the economics and we call that company the category king. And so, so competitions for losers and we want to create a whole new space that currently doesn't exist for us to dominate. And on its face, I know that sounds crazy because when you show up to your shareholders and say, hey, here's what we're going to do, Jeremy. We're going to attack a zero billion dollar space. We're going to go, we're going into a giant market with no spending in it. Right. That's what we're doing. It sounds crazy. But in point of fact, it's actually the much less risky move. What's the process that you went through with the BTO? And then how has the process changed now? Because obviously you've been doing it for, for a lot longer with many other companies. Yeah. So, you know, the process was pretty well defined back then because, it, you know, I've been working on this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. This was the early thousands. And, you know, I've been working on, we didn't call it category design then, but I've been working on category design pretty much since the beginning of my career because I'm just not somebody that ever accepted the status quo. But by that point, you know, a real process for doing this emerged. And so, you know, there were, we did workshops and, you know, we did, we did jam sessions. And, but to be clear, the key things that we worked on were first, first of all, we were very intentional, intentional. We are designing a new category that we want to dominate and we want to be the company that sets the agenda in our industry and everybody else has to come and respond to our agenda. That there was nothing at Mercury that was accidental about that. That was explicit. And every single executive knew when we started the process and, and when we rolled BTO out internally, uh, Jeremy, make no mistake, every employee knew. We went on an inter we did a we did our lightning strike at Mercury in September. We did an internal roadshow over that summer teaching the entire company with, of course, a huge focus on the sales force, what the new strategy was that we're going to go create this category BTO, what our new point of view was, how to go deliver the new corporate deck with the new point of view in it, how we were going to compete, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we did a no joke fly around the fucking world, launch this bullshit in fucking Frankfurt. You know, we did that. And so so when we did our lightning strike in September, October, the whole company was ready to go play. Um, and so uh, to get back to your question, getting real focused on the problem, uh, developing a provocative, engaging point of view that would evangelize the problem and position the solution, um, and um, training the whole company, uh, hugely, hugely important. And then when we went to market, we did what the legends did. We didn't do, if you'll allow me, what the losers do, which is losers market their product. Hmm. Losers market their features. Losers have a better conversation with their category. We had a different conversation. We said it's time for a new agenda in information technology. Hmm. And then we, we were, we were, we were uh, and I'll use this phrase on purpose, we were ballsy enough to, to assert that we had the new agenda for chief information officers around the world. And that agenda was business technology optimization. What business technology optimization was, was a new approach to running IT like a business. And, um, and you had to adopt a BTO strategy and therefore a set of BTO software technologies yeah. if you wanted to quote unquote run IT like a business. And, and we began to have that dialogue. The other thing I think that's important, we tied the category design, Jeremy, to a uh, what Jim Collins in Good to Great and Built to Last calls a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Because people need a raison d'etre. And our uh, raison d'etre was um, uh, to become a top five software company. Hmm. And our analogy was a simple one. If the idiots at SAP could become a top five software company optimizing accounting and manufacturing, we could become a top five software company optimizing and automating IT. It was sort of that simple of a stretch. And so internally, everybody understood we were on a mission to build a top five software company. And that's why we were launching this new category and point of view right. around BTO. Yeah. And when you launch it, I mean, there's a lot riding 
on this, right? The term, the the redesign, and I'm sure you went through a lot of iterations to get to, okay, this is what we're, we're going out with, with BTO. How do you, is there a way that you test it before you have this whole internal and external campaign to get it to catch on in the whole, essentially creating an industry? Is there any ways to test, like if someone's thinking about, this is the process they wanna take it through, how do they know when they come to that term, this is what I should go off? I mean. Yeah, it, it's a great question. So, and funny, I was just on a conversation with a, an executive team about their, um, about their category naming yesterday. Yeah. And we were, we were right in the meat of this. So, <coughs> excuse me, I have a bit of a cough. Um, so, this is going to sound insane. <laughs> you don't fucking test it the way you would normally think about testing something. Mm -hmm. So I think I think when most people think about testing something, they think about, we have an existing product, we got uh, 10 ideas for what we should put in the next version of this product, and we wanna understand of those 10 ideas, you know, what are the three that most matter to our customers? So we're gonna do some surveys and some focus groups, and we're gonna do that stuff. <coughs> That is all awesome for the scenario I just described. Right. There will be no breakthrough that comes from that. Right. So, so when you test category design, when you test a point of view, you're, you're listening, you're testing it, but you're not listening for what most people listen for, which is what should we do? Do you like this? Do you agree? Does this resonate with you? That's, and then they get quote feedback and they modify their shit based on the feedback. And what you end up with is a bunch of modified shit that's meaningless, right? You can always tell strategy or marketing that's done by a committee because it's a piece of shit, right? <laughs> and it says nothing. It's just pavlomatic, happy horse shit that's completely forgettable. So, so. When, when you go to quote test it, what you're testing is, does this work? And what I mean by does this work is, legendary category design is such that when you see it, you can't unsee it, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the stories we tell in the book is the story of this guy, Clarence Birdseye, who's a category designer of frozen food. And before Clarence, there's two categories of food, food, and uh, um, uh, fro and, and like canned uh, goods, uh, canned food. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and canned food, right? And that's it. And I can tell the story if you care. <clears throat> but he's the inventor of frozen food, and then he he teaches the world why frozen food matters, right? And and the way he does that is by evangelizing a problem that at the time the world didn't know it had, which is, hey, how come we can't have uh, fresh tasting peas in February? And that's not a problem until he says that. And then you go, yeah, that's bullshit. How come I can't Until have you taste canned food, then you know it's a problem, <laughs> actually. But yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's, a, that's an example from the past. The most recent example of new category design that I know of, Jeremy, I got an email recently from Patagonia. And they were introducing their new, and this is a direct quote, fair trade fleece. That's category design. Hmm. And here's, <coughs> here's, <coughs> Jesus, here's why I say that. When you and I buy a sweater, there is a selection criteria in our head that already exists because the category is already designed. Does it fit? Uh, how does it feel? Does this sweater make my ass look fat, et cetera, right? And then if it's a functional sweater, you know, so if you're a skier or, you know, somebody that does things, then, you know, is it fit to purpose? Is this a sweater I want to wear skiing or, or hiking yeah. or whatever? That More of the features. Is? Correct. But for the most part, that's the criteria we use, you and I use, to decide whether or not we're going to buy a sweater. <coughs> what, what Patagonia is doing is they're now redesigning the selection criteria for a fleece. And what they're saying is, have you considered how this fleece was made, where it came from? 
did the people who made this fleece get fucked over or did they get paid? Uh, uh, did, did, was this fleece made in a way that was environmentally responsible or irresponsible, hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And right. so, so just like coffee makers brought, shined a light on something we now, you and I as consumers understand as fair trade coffee, right. Pat, Patagonia is trying to do, th- do that with the sweater. And so my point is they're not competing with a word, our sweater is better than their sweater strategy, which is the way most people compete. Right. They're competing by saying there's a whole new criteria for evaluating sweaters that you heretofore haven't considered that we think you should. And if they are successful in making that criteria uh, a, a, an important consideration for sweater buyers, they will have redesigned the category in so far as they will have changed um, the criteria by which people evaluate and then value and, and then purchase sweaters. And if the world a- accepts that um, this new uh, uh, design is important, then all of a sudden they'll be the leader. Right. And that's what happens over and over and over again. Yeah. And there's so many good examples, uh, Chris, in, in Play Bigger, you know, with Uber, Bird's Eye Food, Salesforce. Um, I had two more questions, but um, anything from Play Bigger that you think would be important to mention that we haven't talked about or one of your, your favorite stories or, or points from the book? Yeah, I mean, there's so there's so many. Uh, one of the really big ones, of course, is this concept of position yourself or be positioned. Hmm. So Muhammad Ali famously said, if I don't tell them I'm the greatest, how are they going to know? <laughs> and so most people let the world position them as opposed to do what Muhammad Ali did. And so, or said a different way, if we don't tell the world how to think about us, then they're going to think about us how they want to think about us. Category designers don't leave that up to chance, whether it's their product, their company, or, or themselves as an individual. And so... Um, when we get proactive about our own category design, we tell the world. Somebody says, what do you do? You know, my my answer to that question today is I'm on, on a mission to help people design a legendary life and a legendary business. Hmm. That's what I tell them. You know, that's a very different answer than what most people might say, which is, you uh, I'm an author or I'm a podcaster or I'm a retired CMO or, you know, right. Like they define themselves of their past, whatever the position was. Well, yes. And, and more importantly, they give you a feature. Yeah. When somebody asks me what I'm up to, um, I, I tell them what my mission is in the context of the problem that matters to me. And and the problem that matters to me is entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. and people living a shitty life because It, I, I didn't know, Jeremy, that, that for a lot of people, um, just hearing, hey, you know what? You can design the life you want. Right. That's, a, that's like a... It's a breakthrough. An aha. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? It was for me, too. But for me, it happened so long ago, I forgot how profound it was. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then on the business side, we know what the failure rates of entrepreneurial businesses are, right? right. And so... A number, one of the number one uh, causes of failure is inability to get traction in the world. And the reason for that inability to get traction in the world is we don't position our companies. We have a product conversation. Yeah. And that product conversation, uh, people need context. If I say to you, hey, uh, Jeremy, tonight we're going to go out to dinner and we're going to go to uh, Jimmy's restaurant. What's likely the first question you ask me? Well, if it's Jimmy's restaurant, what kind of food is it? Yeah. And so you and I as human beings, you just asked me what category is Jimmy's restaurant. That's what you just said. And when I say, oh, it's Italian, you now understand. Because you and I as human beings need a category to relate to it. As a matter of fact, and this is, this is, this is something that by the time I die, the world's going to get this one, Jeremy. You ready? Shoot. Categories make companies, not the other way around. Hmm. Categories make brands, not the other way around. 
Google's brand today is considered to be almost on par in terms of brand equity by the by the geniuses that measure this shit. It's it's getting to Coca-Cola like status. Now, that's awesome. However, when a when Google, one of the biggest brands in the world, attacks an existing market category with an existing category king with a we're better than them product strategy, they fail. They spent billions of dollars on Google Plus. They had their ass handed to them. They have a product that competes against a product uh, that they that they quote sell for free that most people tell you is meaningfully better than a product Microsoft sells for 250 bucks a year that really hasn't been updated much for the better part of a decade called Microsoft Office. Right. And most people say Google Docs is better and it's free. It's free. Right? Of course. No yeah. one uses it. No one. Fucking no one. What? Do you think that will ever catch on? No, it will never catch on because problems create categories. And when we identify with the problem, we buy the solution from the company that told us about the problem. And you and I as human beings need category kings because they make decisions easy. So there is nobody in the world that hires a consultant to do a RFP for which spreadsheet should we buy for our company. Nobody has that discussion. Nobody. You just buy Microsoft Office. End of discussion. Period. It doesn't even happen. You just you just Microsoft Office, right? And somebody can say, "Hey, Google Docs is free," and everyone goes, "Yeah, whatever." Microsoft Office. And the reason is, people don't buy the best product; they buy the category king's product. That's you know, I was thinking about this the other day, this exact example, and thinking probably the people you and I know and talk to. Do any of them use Microsoft? All of them do. They do? Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like everyone's, I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people, you know, in this sector are, are tech savvy and they're just using Google Docs, but the majority of the world are, are not using that. Correct. I mean, look, is there, is, if you ask me, is there a higher propensity to Google Docs in Silicon Valley than there is in the rest of the world? I, I don't have data about that, Jeremy, but I would imagine that's true. Yeah. And in the startup world, they're probably all using that shit because it's free and it's really good. And, you know, if you're right. 22 years old and, and that's really cool and all that. Um, but until somebody reimagines the problem, nothing's going to change. Hmm. Even with a free product from one of the top brands in the world, a brand that is bigger than Microsoft's brand. And so my point is categories make brands, not the other way around. What makes Google's brand valuable is they're the category king in search. In 1999, Dell had a legendary brand. Michael Dell couldn't get arrested in Times Square today. And and, and, and everybody read Innovator's Dilemma, Jeremy, and go, oh, that's good. They that's fucking wrong. Christensen was wrong. It wasn't a failure to innovate. That's not why Dell is fucked. It's category violence. So they make awesome products. They have an awesome brand. No one cares. Why? Because servers, laptops, storage, and professional services are not hot categories. The hot categories are the cloud our mobile, hmm. our social, our virtualization, our artificial intelligence, our machine learning, et cetera, in, in the tech world, okay? Right. And so what happens is there were a set of the things you could call from twos, right? That moved from buying storage to renting cloud storage. Well, if you're in the business of selling servers and storage, your business is now fucked. But it's not because you fail to innovate in the way most people think about it. When, mm. when you hear failure to innovate, what most people hear is they didn't do the right cool shit with their products. Right. They did all kinds of right cool shit with their products. People stopped buying those products. And so category design is about how you make those giant uh, from twos happen. And so you, 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 you make the market come to you. You create demand where there was no demand. Yeah. Talk about, because we're on, on that topic, failure to innovate versus category design and blockbuster. 
Yeah. So the thing about what would, what would he would he what would you say about Blockbuster as far as those two things? They get an F on both. Right. So so fit, complete failure to innovate with their product and service. It, it really it was what it was from the time they opened the door. It didn't get much different over the better part of 20 years. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's almost like you have to do both at the same time. Like with Blockbuster, they they would have to even if they innovated on that and they sent the VHSs out in the mail, they still didn't design a category around that. Correct. So they'd Correct. have to do both of them. That's exactly right. And 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 the, the reason the innovators dilemma thinking is so dangerous is you could have been innovative with your business model and your approach and all that uh, mm. at Blockbuster, but unless you were designing the new category, right? They'll just the, find competition. It, you, correct. Yeah. Innovation is for competition, and competition yeah. is for losers. Yeah. And the the only person who should be innovating in 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 that traditional context is the category king. Yeah. Yeah. And the biggest risk for the category king of course is not failure to innovate. Look, uh, uh Twitter hasn't innovated since the day they pressed the on button. There's no innovation. 140 characters done, and we're now a decade in. Zero innovation. The new innovation is maybe they'll double the amount of characters we can have. Oh, good. But like, no innovation. Zero. Nothing. Right? It's about growing the category. Yeah. Hmm. Talk about you know you're big in philanthropy and one life. I want you to talk a little bit about that and your involvement with that. Thank you. Um, so OneLifeFullyLive.org is a uh, organization founded by my dear friend Tim Rode, and he's a uh, former realtor and now real estate investor who has a huge commitment to giving back. And, um, you know, right now my favorite quote about all this is the, um, the Kevin Spacey quote, Jeremy, where he says, uh, if you're lucky enough to make it to the top of the building, you should send the elevator back down. Mm. And I think... Those of us who are uh, entrepreneurial, and, and Tim, like me, is a small e entrepreneur, started with nothing, had no reason for anybody to believe in him, and, and, and started painting uh, um, uh, uh, street numbers for people on the sidewalk, you know, and, and built, built, built himself up from there. So uh, what One Life is about is we're a nonprofit committed to helping people dream, plan, and live their best life. And, and to give people the tools, technologies, and relationships to do that for as close to free as possible. So think about motivational and inspirational personal development shit. Uh, think about uh, financial planning, both on the personal side and on the, on the business side. And then think about either being an entrepreneur or being entrepreneurial in one way or another in your life. You know, so if you sort of think about those dimensions, right, from, from as simple as how do, you, how do you balance a checkbook for kids to uh, how do you understand, when, when once you get past that on the financial side, how do you play good offense and defense? A lot of people just play offense, they don't get the defense part, so we wanna do some base financial planning because the average American is three paychecks away from personal bankruptcy. Yeah. And the average yeah. American is two, uh, two personal crises, or crisi, if that's the plural, <laughs> Uh, away from uh, personal bankruptcy. You have a big healthcare problem and you lose your job and you're it's fucked. It's over, yeah. Yeah, and so none of that is okay with us. And so we want to help people understand the things that they, they can do in their financial life uh, to make a difference in that regard. And, and, and then on the personal side, um, like we talked about earlier, you know, there are a lot of people who don't even realize you, you can design your own life. Life isn't what happens to you. Life is what you happen to. Um, and the minute you understand you can design your own life, then the next logical question is, okay, well, how? <laughs> and so right. we have a curriculum at One Life that shows you how. Um, and then, and then we want to we want to we want to spawn more entrepreneurs, and we want to stoke more uh, more existing entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, some of those entrepreneurs are biggie entrepreneurs, but a lot of them are small e entrepreneurs. Uh, we're starting to do a lot of one life work in the inner cities. Um, 
And and so we're trying to go to the places where people need it the most. And, and, and the message is really simple. You can design plan and, and, and live out your best life. And we're here to help you. And we're here to try to do that for as close to free as possible with a collection of big hearted, committed people who want to do that with you. Yeah. Chris, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been amazing. I want to, uh, I have one last question, but I want to point people towards where they should find out more. And you have a couple probably places. Where should we point people towards online? The best place, and it's the place where you can get to all the other places if you care to go to any of the other ones, is yeah. just legendsandlosers.com. Okay, cool. And you can you know learn more about Play Bigger there. You can check out you know um, all of the episodes of Legends and Losers. And if you want to find me on Twitter and LinkedIn and all those other places, you, all that hangs off of legendsandlosers.com. Awesome. Everyone check out legendsandlosers.com. Last question, Chris, and for, I'm sorry for people just listening to audio, but um, I like to know what inspires you, and I'd love to have you just talk a little bit about everything, the cool, inspiring stuff you have behind you in your office for a second. Yeah, well, th thanks for noticing. Uh, you know, when we started Legends and Losers, Jeremy, I, I, we wanted to have a video podcast because, you know, why not? <clears throat> And of course, you know, our show, like I'm guessing your show is mostly people listening on a on a, a device where they don't see us. But but video is easy and free. And so just boom, there it is. Um, and, and so we wanted to have you know, an interesting background. But more importantly, to your point. Where we live and where we work matters. Our environment matters. I just saw today, I was stoked to find out just this morning, National Geographic, I guess yesterday maybe, came out with a list of the happiest cities in the United States. Hmm. And Santa Cruz is number two. Wow. And so, and since I've lived here, it, it's really struck me like, you know, the environment you're in, I know this sounds stupid, like a duh, but it really, really matters. And so, long story longer, I uh, wanted to create an environment uh, to, to do Legends and Losers, you know, number one rule at Legends and Losers is Legends and Losers is fun. Right. And so we wanted to create a, a studio that was a good functional studio and that had lots of inspiring shit around so that like every time you walked into the studio, you're reminded of things that are legendary. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So what's around you? Oh, so you want me to yeah. walk you through? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and you know, I could take I could take the camera off and give you a full tour if you if you want. Um, so we have a couple of guitars. We have um, um, we have a Hagstrom guitar, which is what my uncle played. It's also what Elvis and the Beatles played. And um, Pat Smear from the Foo Fighters is probably the most famous Hagstrom player today. Uh, ne and that's the red one. Next to that, the white one is a white custom Les Paul and. You know, I was a kid that didn't grow up with very much money at all, and, and uh, it was never even in my realm of possibility to think that one could own such a piece of uh, uh, musical equipment. But, um, you know, there, there she is, and I, I think it's the greatest guitar in the world. You want to hear rock and roll, you put a custom Les Paul through a Marshall tube amp, and, and that's what Slash sounds like, and that's what Jimmy Page sounds like, and that's what the Ramones sound like, and that's what fucking rock and roll is. Um and then uh, there's a sign over there. I don't know. Let me see if I, I can. can't see it now. Uh, okay, I don't know yeah. if you can see yeah, that. Yeah, you there's can a see sign, it. Uh, there that my wife got me that I think is really funny uh, that says, I'm not saying I'm Batman. I'm just saying no one has ever seen me and Batman in a room together. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, that's a, this is a picture of Steve McQueen in his um, uh, Shelby Cobra Mustang pulling out backwards. And A, Steve McQueen might be the coolest guy of all time. B, Shelby Cobras are the coolest car of all time. And C, I like things that are different, Jeremy. Right. And so most people, if you're going to put up a picture of like a muscle car or somebody doing something cool in a car, they're going forward. What I love about this, this is from the streets of San Francisco. Oh, no, excuse me. This is from Bullet. And he's pulling out backwards at 80 miles an hour. You can see the tire mm. smoke. And so that's cool. Uh, above him, we have uh, one of my... Huge heroes, Leonard Cohen, God rest his soul, and his amazing his amazing album, Songs of Love and Hate. Next to Leonard, we got Batman and Robin from the original 60s TV series. Mm. And they're going up. Is that Adam you know, is Adam West play Batman fuck, in there? Yeah, fuck yeah. Adam, Adam West and Burton Ward. Let me get this one for you. 
And you can see they're climbing up a wall. If you remember the series, you would have these 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 photos of them with mm, the, with the bat rope going nice. up the side of the wall. Nice. And this is a this photo shows you how they shot those, That's and they awesome. have this the string attached to the cape to make it look like they're actually climbing up a wall. And it's very corny and very quiche, <laughs> or, or very kitschy rather. And then um, this is Tom Waits, the legendary Tom Waits, um, probably the greatest songwriter of all time. Above him is the Ramones. Next to him is is Muhammad Ali. And I love this picture because um, most people, if they have a picture of Muhammad Ali or any kind of a fighter, the fighter is doing the hitting. It's hitting shot someone, or, right. Or doing the winning. What I love about this shot is he's, he's slipping the punch. Right. Because the first thing you learn when you start to train boxing or martial arts is there's two parts of this. There's hitting and not getting hit. And the not getting hit part is actually more important than the hitting part. Right. Uh, and then Floyd, Wh- Floyd Mayweather hands, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's boring to watch if you're not a fighter, Floyd. And I, as a fan, I don't love watching Floyd fight. Were you rooting? Who did you think was going to win that one? Conor McGregor? I thought McGregor was going to... Oh, excuse me. I thought Floyd was going to win. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would have been shocked had McGregor won. But uh, I would be less than candid, Jeremy, if I didn't tell you I was really rooting for McGregor. Right. I mean, I didn't think it was going to happen. And I thought McGregor did incredibly well. I mean, you know, when you go 11 rounds against the greatest boxer of this era um, and you hit him more times than Manny, Manny Pacquiao did, you had a good night, yep. you know? For sure. So I think I think McGregor was, was awesome. Um, that's London calling the clash. Obviously, the, uh, a vintage flag of California. Now, I, to me, the flag of California is so... Um, powerful and mm-hmm. sad because of course the california uh brown bear is virtually extinct mm. and so it's a it's an incredible thing that our icon is this animal that we fucking killed mm. it's, it's very it's it, it, it you know it, and today there are some we could repopulate the sierras with them but um it it, it, it would make uh it would make the uh, summers on in, in lake tahoe very exciting for people um but I digress. And then this amazing surfboard right here. Um, I can't see that on the camera. It's, uh, I'm going to make you move the camera again. Yeah, there we go. So this is a custom surfboard that uh, my dear friend, the legendary Tasmanian devil of Australian marketing, uh, Von O'Connor, uh, he, runs, he runs what a lot of people consider to be sort of the preeminent kind of high-end marketing boutique in, in, in Australia. And he's a wicked surfer, and um, and so he got me. He knows the Ramones are my favorite band, and so he got me this custom board, which is gorgeous, with this amazing. This is actually a custom paint job, and so wow. that's uh, that's Joey Ramone uh, yeah. on the bottom of the board. Yeah, Love so it. that's a sl- a small tour, and there's other shit around here. My my friend Scott Lowry, the boards are on the other side of the studio. Hard to show you, but. Um, he, he also got me a custom board from Robert, Robert August and he had the legends and losers, losers logo put on the board mm, and cool. it's absolutely gorgeous. So we have two, two official surfboards in the legends and losers studio. And we got over there, we got Godzilla and, uh, Steve Austin, the $6 million man. And, and then my favorite, my favorite, um, um, uh, license plate, which says if it's tourist season, why can't we shoot them? <laughs> I won't be going to California near you, though. <laughs> well, it's just, and I, you know, I don't mean it that that horribly, but um, <laughs> it's funny living in a in a beach town, right? Because the town swells yeah. up weekend and right. swells up in the summer, and um, for sure, it, it gets irritating quickly. It's like, okay, well, thanks for coming and spending your money in Santa Cruz. Now, would you please get the fuck out, <laughs> <laughs> Chris? Thank you. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out legendsandlosers.com. Much appreciated. Thank you, Jeremy. The pleasure's been all mine. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.